May we open our hearts and minds to the reading from the Acts of the Apostle. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound from heaven like the howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When they heard this sound, a, gra a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native languages. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all the people who are Galileans, every one of them? How then can each of us hear them speaking in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, as well as residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt and the regions of Libya bordering Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the mighty works of God in their own languages. They were all surprised and bewildered. Some asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered at them saying, they're full of new wine. Peter stood with the other 11 apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this. Listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk, as you suspect. After all, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. A sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. The Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. What was that? Perhaps you've heard or asked this question before. In the quiet of the evening when you've retired for the day and you hear a loud noise coming from somewhere in the house or outside a window. What was that? Perhaps you've responded after watching an unexpected ending to a movie or a performance. Or maybe after witnessing a scene in which some kind of tantrum or emotional outburst breaks into a seemingly peaceful gathering. What was that? Today is Pentecost. It's a time when we celebrate the birth of the early church. And it brings a similar question to mind. Our church ancestors, the disciples, and about 140 of their close family and friends were hunkered down. Together in one place, the scripture's careful to note. They were waiting. Remember, Jesus has ascended to heaven and but had promised to remain with his believers in spirit, to send them someone to guide them and to walk with them and to walk beside them on life's journey. I would guess they had been looking and waiting and hoping. Where was this presence? It seemed to them like it was pretty much business as usual. They were still being oppressed and marginalized. Folks were still laughing at them for what they believed. Folks were going about their business with the larger part of the population still not buying in to this ministry of Jesus. And now during this Jewish festival, the folks gathered in this room were no doubt strategizing their next move. How might we continue to be faithful, especially now that our Messiah is no longer physically present? 
Perhaps they were asking themselves, how will we ever overcome the evils of the world or offset the messages filled with religious piety and finance through political oppression? Can't you just picture these 150 or so folks debating and pondering their next move? What was that? A mighty wind, some tongues of fire, a great disturbance and lots of excitement. So in the scripture that Anagel read, full of some really tough words by the way, Anagel, so sorry about that. But what happened here anyway? In a nutshell, three things. The first one was this. That God came unexpectedly. Which of course is nothing new. God seems to make a hobby of sneaking up on the human race when no one is looking except those with the faith. And those with the heart to recognize God in strange places. Look how God came in the oddest forms in our scripture a burning bush, a tongue-tied stutterer named Moses, a little boy with a slingshot, and a baby in a manger. So here's this little band of frightened disciples whose leader has gone off and left them. They're stunned, they're confused, unable to figure out what to do. They're about to give up, saying things like, we're never going to get this thing started. We're never going to get this gospel message off the ground. It's never going to grow. I heard that message about five years ago. Then along comes God unexpectedly when no one is looking. I like to share this story. You may have heard me share it before. It's the story of a little boy by the name of Angelo. Lived in a small town near a South American border. And one day he crossed the border and came back with a wheelbarrow full of sand. When the customs inspector got suspicious and asked him what he was smuggling in the sand, Angelo replied, nothing. The customs officer made him pour out all the sand and sifted through it before he permitted him to go on. The next day, the same thing happened. The third day, fourth day, and so on. Weeks, months went by. Every day, the inspector said, now, Angelo, I know you think I'm going to get careless someday and you're going to smuggle something across, but as long as you bring this sand, I'm going to make you pour it through this screen. So don't you ever think you're going to get by with something. Well, Angelo kept coming for five years. Every day appearing with his wheelbarrow and every day the customs folks made him pour it out and sifted through it and found nothing. One day, little Angelo didn't show, but everyone heard how he had prospered and bought his parents a big house and had a thriving business. Years later, the inspector who'd retired met Angelo on the street and asked him, how did you become so prosperous when you spent so much time hauling sand across the border and there was never anything in it? Angelo smiled and said, my friend, during those five years, when you were paying so much attention to the sand, I smuggled 1,593 wheelbarrows into this country. <laughs> I think this little story makes a point that lies at the heart of the Pentecost message. Namely, that sometimes we grow so accustomed to thinking of God in a certain way and looking for God in a certain form that we're caught completely off guard as to who God really is and as to where God can really be found. The disciples had their preconceptions and were no doubt shocked beyond words when the Spirit came upon them when they least expected it. But the fact is, my friend, the God of Pentecost is the same God who came at Christmas and rose on Easter morning, who keeps appearing unexpectedly in our lives. The God of Pentecost is seen when churches proclaim an inclusive love, sharing with others God's grace, which is open to all who seek to be in communion with their Creator and with one another. 
You see, when inspectors of Christian faith focus on hurtful and hate-filled messages that they post on YouTube or Facebook or billboards, which take our beloved Scripture completely out of context, we can emerge across the boundaries with wheelbarrows filled with folks who have been marginalized by society, rejected by churches, or perhaps worst of all, they become indifferent to the imaginative possibilities of what a true community grounded in God's love can be. This Pentecost story is about something else. It's about inviting us to start anew in our own Christian lives. Perhaps you're going through a difficult time. Someone you love has come and gone the way Jesus did for the disciples. Maybe you're confused this morning, disoriented. But if you'll be open to it, God can come totally out of the blue. Perhaps God has been there all the time, smuggling just little bits of grace into our lives in ways we never imagined. The second thing that happened with those folks gathered in the room was that the church caused a disturbance unexpectedly. Clearly something was happening that day. We're not exactly sure what. But it was kind of wild and swashbuckling and sort of hard to explain. Think of that first Pentecost. There was a big disturbance with lots of commotion. The world said, that bunch over there must be drunk. But Peter, a real half-sermon, real travel kind of guy, he said, no, nah, they can't be drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. But Peter said, now that I have your attention, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. Now here's an interesting model for evangelism. No revival or crusade with thousands stumbling forward to just as I am. But instead, the church does something startling in the community. And the world says, what are y'all doing over there? And the church responds, let me tell you about my God, our God. What was that? A refugee is not only welcome, but arrives to a place they can finally call home and they find linens on the bed and groceries in the pantry. A family who's lost all hope of ever having their own home watches as people they don't know volunteer their time and efforts towards a habitat build. A child on summer break from school opens a backpack filled with food for his or her family. Two little girls living in poverty hear a knock on the door. And some folks from a church they've never heard of arrive with Christmas dinner and Christmas gifts. A gay teenager seems to be running awry, searching for someone to embrace him or her for all that God's created them to be instead of victimizing them for being different suddenly stumble onto a church booth at the local pride festivities. What was that? When churches make a decision to feed the hungry and help the poor in their communities, it's amazing how many non-church types sit up and take notice, isn't it? Some of them even sign up to serve stew or help counsel people who are struggling with financial responsibility or interviewing for jobs. I've seen it happen time and time again. Invariably, folks will ask the crucial question. Now tell me again, what, why do you all do this? And just like Peter, we church members have our opening. Let me tell you about a God of inclusive love. Or if we don't want to be that explicit, we can treat it the way Philip did with Nathaniel and simply say, come and see. Come to church on Sunday morning with me. 1 
First, God came unexpectedly. Second, the church caused a disturbance that made the world sit up and take notice. And third, the people came together in a way they had never done before. It's always amazing to me to see how God brings us together. People with different languages, different political persuasions, different theological ideas. What was that? Well, over there in Diana Drive, there are Baptists and Presbyterians and Catholics and Episcopalians, Reformed Jews. Well, there's some people not quite sure what they are. Or if they are anything. What was that? You come in that church and there's black folk and white folk, young and old, struggling and comfortable, gay and straight and transgender. Can you hear the question fill in the air when people see us gathered under a pride booth or in these chairs Sunday after Sunday? What is that? <laughs> and yet, yet together we form a church family. In such a way that even a first time visitor to the church remarks to the pastor on a Sunday afternoon more than four years ago. And I might add, this first time visitor has become an integral part of our church family. But here's what they wrote to me just a week or so after their first visit with us four years ago. And I quote, when I entered the sanctuary, the Spirit, she met me. I smiled and I sat and I watched. I watched and saw a glimmer of what church can look like. I saw people hug and kiss and touch and smile. I experienced people being real. And I swear, Marcia, my experience of church began long before you came into the sanctuary long before the official service ever began. I surveyed the room and I saw people sitting together, touching, being who they were, and I felt the ghost of my long past hurt begin to fade away in a mystical kind of way that I can't really explain. I felt myself saying, well, I thought there was no hope left for the church. And suddenly before my very eyes, there was the gospel. And I felt myself move to tears. And the service hadn't even started. I looked at my friend and said, I need a Kleenex. Wow. Talk about a burning bush kind of moment. I experienced the gospel without a word being said. What was that? Brothers and sisters, I hope you'll begin to ask that question a lot in the days and weeks and months and years ahead as we journey together. United in our diversity, coming as we are to be who God calls us to be. You see, when the Spirit moves us and when we choose to be open to God's Spirit among us, God will come in unexpected places and people and circumstances. About three years ago, around this time of the year, I pronounced with admittedly some anxiety to Bluegrass United Church of Christ and to the folks of Emmanuel United Church of Christ. I said, I don't know what God's Spirit's trying to do here, but if we'll get out of the way, something amazing might happen in the life of our churches. When the Spirit moves us, and when we choose to be open to God's Spirit among us, the world's going to look at us, and they're going to ask, What is that? Who are they? The community of faith seems to be different than the ones that get the most airtime or have the largest buildings or budgets. But folks will say, these folks are walking the talk of Jesus in a way I've never experienced. When the Spirit moves us, and when we choose to be open to God's Spirit among us, 
we'll come together like we never have before. Like our ancestors of faith in the midst of despair and confusion, we'll step out in faith and proclaim the gospel message to all. Those who look and talk like us and those who don't. And we will rely on God's Spirit working through us to be the translator of a message that seemed foreign and drowned out by the familiarity of rhetoric and easy answers to difficult questions. Little Kiara asked a difficult question, didn't she? And there's not an easy answer. But I hope, I hope that people will look at us and say, what was that? And I hope it will be answered by us in our actions, in our spiritual disciplines, in our commitment to our faith and our church. That is God. That's God's lessons. That's God's healing. That's God's challenge. That's God's love. That's God's inclusivity. That is God's radical actions of justice. And you know what? We may be accused of being drunk or worse. But that's what Pentecost can be for us. That noise which hastens us and strengthens us for the journey ahead. That wind that blows us wildly out of our comfort zones. That is God challenging us and calling us. Sweet Spirit of God working in us and through us. Not in spite of our diversity, but because of it. So my friends, go. Go give folks something to talk about. And live full of the Spirit, which we claim still blows wildly in our lives. I hope they call me drunk every day. <laughs> <laughs>